The discovery that Gaia's children had been blessed with the gift of sapience had sent shockwaves rippling throughout the entire Gamma Quadrant. While many of the Alliance's territories could live shrouded in ignorant bliss for a little while longer, as communications between quadrants could take multiple days, those unfortunate enough to share their little section of the universe with these hellworlders were forced to face the possibility that sooner or later they would have to initiate first contact with their own worst nightmares. These cosmic devils had barely left their home system, and the entire quadrant was already collectively holding its breath and preparing for the unthinkable. The royal family of the Atnian monarchy has already revised their constitution multiple times since the discovery in an attempt at trying to avoid sending any potential heirs to the battlefield. The Quizuin's Free Democratic Republic, who I'd like to personally applaud for their pragmatism and quick thinking, are currently busy converting every single peacekeeping vessel into something that could potentially fend off the oncoming apocalypse. Then there's the Enoe. As usual, no one really knows what they're up to, but my spies tell me their megaforges have been active around the clock, and the amount of pollution on their industry worlds has multiplied tenfold. And last but not least, there's us, the Anolis Theocracy. In the past, we've always been seen as a mighty religious bulwark for so many lesser civilizations to cling to and hide behind. And as such, I see it as our duty, nay, our destiny, that we may help foster peace and cooperation between all species, no matter who they are, so that together we might vanquish these hellish abominations once and for all. It is to this extent that I, Grand Vizier Atleon, have decided to spearhead an initiative whereby I, the Grand Priest, and the other heads of state, we will gather on the GA Authoritative, one of our largest space stations, and discuss what is to be done about the newest threat knocking on the Alliance's door. With a bit of luck, we'll be able to pool our knowledge and experience together, as well as hopefully coordinate our actions in an attempt at driving these cosmic horrors back to where they came from. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't try to deny the severity of the situation, for as you already know, the galaxy is at the precipice of destruction. We may very well be facing the apocalypse as described in many of our sacred texts, a genuine biblical end of days, if you will. But do not despair, for as long as we, those appointed by the gods, draw breath, there is still hope. We still have divine providence on our side, and together we can fight off these monsters. Grand Vizier Atleon bellowed into his microphone as his fellow heads of state began to focus on the large orb embedded in the center of the council room, which came to life with a soft electronic hum. It opened up, and as if conjuring from thin air, it began to draw an unsettling image of some sort of bull-like abomination adorned in flames and smoke. This creature was covered in darkened scales, which seemed to crack and give way to fiery veins of smoldering magma, and its eyes burned bright with a cursed hellfire. It was as if this creature had been spawned from fire and brimstone itself. Upon seeing this, all the council members, who at this point had been quietly murmuring and playing with their communicators, fell silent and started to pay attention. Senator Miss Sella even let out a muffled shriek before trying to make herself as small as possible. Behold, a Gaian! Um, possibly! The Grand Vizier yelled theatrically, knowing that he was going to have to use every trick in the book to get these reprobates to acknowledge his and his species' efforts. After all, while his kind held a lot of political and religious power, compared to the other species, they were fairly useless when it comes to combat. As you might suspect, it's pretty hard to win a fight when your entire body freezes in place at the first sign of danger. A somewhat peculiar gift they had been blessed with thanks to their deity being the god of tranquility and patience. You see, it's been about 68 hours since the Ark of Horrors was spotted, and so in preparation, I've tasked some of the theocracy's finest scientists, psychics, and analysts with studying whatever footage and research we still have left on our soon-to-be enemies. And so as you might have already suspected, what you see here is what Be gone, demon! Do not torture me any longer with your hideous appearance, King Hirunus commanded, while plucking a handful of shiny religious artifacts from his person and dramatically jingling them at the hologram. As I was saying, the Grand Vizier remarked, clearly annoyed by the pedantic child monarch's actions. 
In the interest of preparing ourselves and our peoples for this oncoming storm, I would like to share with you every other potential form these creatures might have evolved into, as well as some of said form's accompanying characteristics. For example, while we're not entirely sure yet what their dietary needs are, aside from souls, based on the size of this creature's claws as well as its sharp teeth, we can make an educated guess and say that it would most likely also devour flesh and bones. Although admittedly that particular type of behavior seems to be shared between most, if not all, potential forms. Which brings us to our next herald of the apocalypse. The Grand Vizier pressed a button on his communicator and with an obnoxious click, the horned fire monster dissipated only to be replaced by what looked to be some sort of aquatic bipedal creature covered in countless tentacles whereas the former seemed to be some sort of unholy amalgamation between a scaly, furless bull and a grease fire, this new one was more akin to a giant squid person that had risen out of the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench. Once again, most of the council members cowered. This was, of course, discounting Atleon, who'd already mentally prepared himself in advance, and the Enoaean representative who was too busy familiarizing his already partially digested lunch with the council floor. You see, it's with this particular evolutionary offshoot that we began to theorize that perhaps, unlike most members of the Alliance, Gaians may be able to thrive in all sorts of environments and not just a specific one. Now, as for our nay, Lord Atleon, Senator Naleto started, I do not think it is necessary to subject this council nor the wider universe to this, this ghastly seminar. Surely most of the fighting would be done in outer space or at the very least over large distances. As always, you strike up an excellent point, Senator, one that I and my associates will take into consideration and use to help shape these most holy proceedings in the future. Click. And with another tap of a button, the aquatic monster was replaced with yet another potential hellworlder. Over the course of the next 30 minutes, the leaders present at the council were subjected to every possible sapient creature GA-14 could have spawned. Everything from winged super lizards that could breathe fire to a mass of eyeballs embedded onto a collection of floating, intersecting rings. As time went on, all of them began to one by one take note of a certain peculiar phenomenon. It was like an itch in the back of their minds. The longer they looked at these holograms, the more uncomfortable they felt. It wasn't just fear. It was as if they were regarding something they shouldn't be allowed to look at, or perhaps something they couldn't entirely comprehend. This feeling only got worse as they reached their final potential foe. Unlike before, when a new apparition would solicit a scream, or made them cower in fear, this last projection had a slightly different effect. The already fairly quiet room went completely silent, as all the council members suddenly felt an unnerving tingle creep up and wash over them. Everyone collectively held their breaths, as the room's temperature suddenly seemed to drop, and everyone became very aware of their own mortality. They felt uncomfortable, perhaps even watched, as if this projection had somehow summoned the creature which shape it resembled. It was as if a long and dark, gloomy shadow was suddenly cast over the entire room, and all these men and women who'd once proudly pronounced themselves protected by the gods felt like a prey being stalked by a predator as if their gods had betrayed them and fled, leaving them to fend for themselves. Like all the other horrors before, this one looked creepy, unnatural, and positively horrifying, but there was more to it than that. This thing, it had some kind of alluring mystique. There wasn't just fear there, it was also, well, a little exciting, like a kid feeling giddy about doing something they weren't supposed to. This made it so that while every fiber of their being told them to look away, that this thing was pure evil and would corrupt them. Somehow they couldn't. They had stared into the abyss and now it was staring back at them. Like many before this was yet another biped, it had two front-facing eyes, a patch of hair on top of its head, and four primary limbs with which it could grasp, fight, and or flight. It was presumably only slightly larger than the galactic average and didn't sport any natural weapons that were immediately obvious aside from perhaps their sturdy endoskeleton and noticeable muscle mass. Of course, this no doubt would bolster the belief that Gaians most likely used their cunning in tandem with latent psychic powers to survive, and perhaps even claim dominion of a small piece of their homeworld. Minutes passed by as the council members felt their sanity slowly slip away, 
while trying to wrestle themselves free from this abomination's alluring visage. In the end, it was Etal, the Enoean representative who managed to reach for his blaster and with one precise shot, ended the presentation. Everyone all right? Everyone still has their soul? Hirunas, the young monarch asked before softly mumbling a prayer. I, uh, I think that's about enough for today. Let's just wrap things up and continue tomorrow. The Grand Vizier said before turning to the staff present in the council room and impressing upon them his desire to keep everything they'd seen just now a secret. His men had informed him that some of these renders, and especially the last one, might have adverse effects on people's psyche, but he'd never expected anything like this. Great. Yet another problem to tackle in the near future, as if I didn't have my hands full already, he thought to himself. And just like that, everyone left. No one complained or retorted. After all, it seemed that trying to peer past the veil and at these Gaians had taken a toll on the esteemed leaders of the quadrant. They were all pretty shaken up and battered emotionally. More than anything, they just wanted to retreat back to their rooms and for at least a little while pretend that none of this had ever happened. Later that evening, Grand Vizier Atleon would find himself sitting behind his study desk, reassessing the day's proceedings. It had all gone so smoothly right up until, Uncle Addy, Uncle Addy, Atleon looked up to see his niece Adnata barge into his office. Look, look, I'm a guy in Blear. The young Inalis ran up to her uncle and proudly twirled around, showing off her costume. Unfortunately for Atleon, the young girl was part of the small yet vocal minority that had seen the discovery of these Gaians as an exciting development instead of the incomprehensible nightmare that it really was. Which is why Adnata had sought fit to, once again, glue a couple of homemade tentacles to her fluffy wool, donned a pair of fake horns and fangs before seeking out her favorite uncle. That looks great, sweetie, but I'm afraid I'm a little busy at the- And, she interrupted him. Um, and what? he asked. And well, do I look like them? Like a Gaian? Um, oh well, you see, we're not exactly sure yet. Look, we're trying our best. Okay, just let Uncle Addy sort this stuff out, and when I'm done, I'll come and visit you and show you some of the stuff the lab coats have been working on. All right? I promise this won't take long. All right, promise. But you better not forget like last time, she said before leaving just as hastily as she'd arrived. As soon as she left, Atleon let out a deep sigh, his facial features hardened into a pensive stare tinted with sadness, aimed at an old family picture on the far left corner of his desk. I'm not sure what frightens me more, brother. The fact that she too has found herself mesmerized by that cursed planet, or that with each passing day she reminds me more and more of you.